Welcome to week 11 of HI3284. And this is another great week in this subject. This week we're looking at moving history. We're looking at film and history. We'll start by looking at film and its precursors. And if you know anything about historians, you know that we love looking at precursors and pushing the history of things back a little bit further than expected. And the second part of this lecture, I'm looking at film and history. So what things, what aspects of film and cinema are historians interested in, and how can historians use film as a historical source. Then in the final part of the lecture, I'm looking at using film to communicate history. So we're picking up on ideas around historical documentaries and the ways in which historical documentaries might not be accurate reflections of the past. It's something that I'm hoping we'll pick up on when we get to tutorial as well. Filmmaking apparatus developed in the 1890s and the 1890s are recognized as the birth of cinema, but historians tend to be interested in precedents and there are many precedents for cinema. The use of projection, the use of moving images for entertainment didn't arrive in the 1890s. They're much older. Recognized precedents include the use of shadow puppets, and shadow puppet shows can be magnificent. The puppets can be large, they can move, they were often projected onto flat surfaces in many ways. The images on the slide come from an episode of Shaun the Sheep, and they capture some of the wonder that is possible with a shadow puppet show. While the YouTube video is apparently in Spanish, if you wish to follow it up, that's not a problem. Sean doesn't speak other than to say, meh. And the episode captures some of the elements of puppetry. You can see on the lower left there, Sean and Bitzer projecting their images onto the screen behind them and their technical competence in creating puppets with moving parts. In the image at the bottom right, you can see that extension of the effect of the show beyond simply the visual element to the element of music. And in other sections of that short video, you can also see the significance of the audience experience and of the cinema as a whole. Shadow puppet shows can be amazing, as can be magic lantern shows. The magic lantern itself predated photography and magic lantern shows predated cinema. Magic lanterns first developed in the Netherlands in the mid 17th century, where they used the sun or a candle as a light source. As the technology evolved, as other forms of illumination became available, the magic lantern show adapted to include them. And indeed, it adapted to include photography once that technology was available. Magic lantern shows were popular, they could travel, and while the National Film and Screen Archive of Australia suggests that cinema quickly replaced the magic lantern. I'm not entirely convinced. There are some important differences, which we'll come to in a moment. But the cinema precursors survived for quite a while after the advent of cinema. And entertainment involving moving images has a long history. On this slide, I note that the Australian author Frank Clune, who was very popular in his time, toured with a lantern show in the 1930s. So he's no longer calling it a magic lantern, but it is a lantern show. He's using projected images created with this device to support his performance of a lecture. And it's quite common to have this kind of mixed media presentation. Even with film, when it starts to be used, it's often part of a larger performance. In particular, Actors could perform in front of a moving projected background. And with the Magic Lantern, some of those shows included elements of film with the lecturer providing narration, both for the still images and for the moving ones, and tying the show together. And this form of mixed media film presentation has a long tail. In particular, a film that I'm familiar with from the 1950s, Northern Safari, I've got a poster for it later in the lecture. It started with the person who made the film sitting in the cinema, narrating his story 
as the film played to the audience. Later, he went on to record a soundtrack for it because his voice couldn't hold out against the popularity of the film. And I think this kind of mixed media presentation continues into the present. It's not surprising it was popular through at least to the 1950s. I think it's still popular now in the form of public lectures and perhaps you could see this lecture itself as a kind of magic lantern show, that there are projected still images, sometimes projected animated images, and commentary provided by a live performer. In many ways, I think we could rename PowerPoint lantern and make some kind of sense. But things do change, and they change in the 1890s. Cinema, film, actual film is different. Projected moving images in the form of film are different from Magic Lantern shows because they're more reproducible. With a Magic Lantern show, a skilled operator could put on an amazing show. But a not-so-skilled operator couldn't produce the same show, even with the same Magic Lantern slides. Cinema, while not completely reproducible, is more reproducible. And it depends very much on photography. Modern photography started with the daguerreotype in 1839, and projection of photographic images started in 1849. This led on to experiments with series of photographic images and technological developments in both the United States and in France. The birth of cinema is generally dated to a show in Paris in 1895 by the Lumiere brothers. In that show, they showed projected moving images to a paying audience. But cinema as we know it today took a while to develop. It took a while for people to feel their way into the possibilities of that technology. Early films were often scenic, so they're essentially moving snapshots of a place. Other early films reenacted significant contemporary events, and their significance can be detected by examining newspapers from the same period. There may be some kind of commentary within the images, but it's more a reenactment or again a moving snapshot. The ability of film to communicate and to communicate emotionally led to its use in propaganda, and here it can be quite subtle propaganda, but it's part of the appeal of early cinema. It's not a story, it's an image which evokes some sense of emotion in the audience. It took time to develop ways of telling stories using film and to develop the language of films, which we're quite familiar with today. So the sense that there are a series of different types of shots which are commonly used, the sense that there is a beginning, a middle and an end to a film, the sense that a film can tell a story rather than just attempt to capture a moment or a series of events. Australia was involved in this process very early. As early as 1896, film was made in Australia and it was used to record Australian urban life. So again, the snapshot of life. And that language of film develops in Australia as well. Film in Australia goes through the mixed media type presentations that occur elsewhere. And within Australia as well, that language of storytelling using film develops. Australia is quite extraordinary, actually, in the early period of cinema for the long, continuous narrative films that were made. The first was made in 1906, and it was the story of the Kelly Gang. However, early Australian cinema was obsessed with bushrangers, but that obsession was nipped in the bud in 1912 when bushranging stories were banned because of their potential effect on young minds with the glorification of law-breaking. I'm not joking. Between 1906 and 1912, Australia was churning out long sequences of film, and it was churning out a great quantity, more than either Britain or the United States. That industry peak, though, is reached in 1911. And then Australia fades from being at the forefront of film production for a variety of reasons. 
and it's not revived until the government looks to finance filmmaking in Australia in the 1970s. And that's as much of early film production as I think I need to cover. There are further technical innovations. There's the inclusion of sound, although early films were not silent. As with the Shaun and the Sheep images, music, right from the start, even before recorded soundtracks, was an important part of the cinema experience, and it is intensely emotional which is something that makes me a bit suspicious about making history with film. Something we'll come to within the tutorial. But for now, we should quickly cruise through historians' engagement with film. Film is a focus of attention for some historians. And there are all sorts of questions that can be asked about the history of cinema. Here is a list of the ones that occurred to me quickly. Historians can look at the content of film and what that says about who controls film and about what societies are interested in. Historians can look at not just the technology of film, but also the business history of film. Historians interested in nationalism have plenty to be interested in in film, and it's something that cinema scholars more generally are interested in. Is there a particular type of film that comes from Australia? Is there a national accent to the films that are produced in any particular place? The history of cinema is also something that's interesting. So cinema, picture palaces are extraordinary places and they become popular very quickly and they tend to attract more women than men. So there are all sorts of histories about women attending cinemas, about what the cinemas themselves were like, about fashions in cinemas. There's plenty to look at. And films are glamorous. And they are inhabited by glamorous stars. Some historians fall for the glamour and spend careers tracking careers through the studio system, seeing how the business of producing films affected the output of particular actors. There's plenty to do. And there's a fair overlap between the history discipline and the English discipline in looking at some of these elements of film and of cinema. I suspect I'm a Philistine, and so that stuff interests me only so much. I'd like you also to consider here how film can be used as evidence by historians. I promised you a poster for Northern Safari. Here it is. It's a film, by the way, that I really hate. You can read my analysis of its significance if you really want to. The link is down at the bottom there. Now, I've issued a warning about treating images as portals into the past. And film is just as problematic as painted or drawn images. Yes, film captures stuff that happened. And many of the early films were about everyday occurrences, city life, things happening. The first Australian film, which was recorded in 1896, recorded the running of the Melbourne Cup. And because of an interest in travel, early Australian films actually captured quite a bit of the continent. In 1911, Francis Bertel set off by bicycle to make his film Across Australia. And that travelogue element of film remained popular for a long time. Northern Safari was filmed on a family trip to Northern Australia in the mid-1950s. It was essentially a home movie put together with commentary by the people on it and then a soundtrack, which included special effects to make it more interesting to the audience, and it toured widely. It was immensely popular. It went overseas. It was showing for around a decade in cinemas, and if you're really interested, you can purchase the DVD, and I think there may be a version on YouTube. I think the travel film has faded a little in cinemas. I can't think of it being popular in the present, but I'm happy to be corrected. I think perhaps it has moved to television, where it is certainly still popular, and that the big screen version, which retains its popularity, is wildlife films rather than strictly travel films. And I think here of The March of the Penguins, various big screen animal films, 
which have attracted audiences in the recent past. But while early film appears to record reality and appears to get across the continent, I think we still need to remain suspicious. Things might look authentic, they might look like they're happening at the moment, but they can still be staged or artfully arranged. People play up for cameras, and that's something that's coming out with YouTube videos and supposedly candid photographs. Often they're posed, and sometimes they're made by people seeking their 15 minutes of fame. Even if things did actually happen as they're represented on film, films are always selective. They're not exhaustive. The filmmaker frames something, and the filmmaker chooses a topic. The filmmaker does not follow an average person through an average life. And a filmmaker also wants an audience. Presenting an average person's average life wouldn't attract much of an audience. Real film, presented as a documentary, has been carefully edited, and it's been sequenced, and it has components that guide the response of the viewer and try to make it more exciting. And I'd like you to consider, again, the role of music and of sound effects in making visual images more interesting. Music, in particular, appeals directly to our emotions and tells us what we should be looking at in the image. I guess it's like a caption to a still photograph. It directs our attention and perhaps it limits our experience as well as guiding it. And film isn't just the raw stuff of history. It's not just a way to look into the past. It's also a communication of history. So it's history itself. Documentaries are widely produced. You've been subjected to some of my documentaries and the subject as I go to the various archives and force you to watch them. I'm not the only historian who makes films. Documentaries are widely produced and they're widely consumed, and they're widely believed. In that second reading for this week, there's a discussion of how documentaries shape the ideas of history students in schools. They're consumed in schools. It's easy for a teacher to put on a documentary for a period at school. And we consume them in our free time as well. They're a rational form of entertainment, something that we feel slightly elevated for doing while still enjoying. That article makes the argument that documentaries are often watched uncritically, that students need to be taught to analyse where the author is coming from and to realise that there is an authorial stance being taken, that this is not a clear representation of the past. This is history. And films can deliberately manipulate the past and the present and be used as propaganda. To do these things effectively, documentary makers use a range of techniques. The reference at the bottom takes you to a blog post about voiceovers and the way that voiceovers are used. Voiceover is an important part. Think about how narration is used over film. It used to be with magic lanterns that a person would stand there and lecture accompanied by moving or still images. Now that aspect is recorded and is part of the documentary itself and perhaps is even harder to interrogate. The voiceover is an important voice of authority and again it directs the audience in its response to the documentary. I would argue that music is also used to direct the audience in its response and to convey authority in terms of what is being presented. Beyond this, there are a range of recognised documentary techniques. Not every documentary uses all of them, but there's something that is part of that language of filmmaking within documentary. So archival footage, footage of the time, gives a documentary authority. Often the audience wouldn't be able to interpret it without direction from the voiceover, but we trust the voiceover and we're guided through our interpretation. If archival footage is not available, reenactment can be used and is often used within documentary. 
Beyond that, evidence can be provided by expert witnesses. Documentaries often contain direct and indirect interviews, including the presence of talking heads, people who are presented as experts in the subject of the documentary and whose words should be taken at face value. Documentaries use other techniques as well, in part to fill in the time. Montage, exposition, wallpaper techniques. And these things tend to be used to keep the audience interested. Wallpaper techniques in particular, generally provided by B-roll footage, give you something to look at while somebody's talking. I'm fully aware of this because I've had B-roll footage played while I've been talking on the various film events that I've participated in. But film has its limitations as a means of communicating history. History can be really hard to convey using documentary. Often our sources aren't pretty, often they're written texts. A written text, well, it doesn't film well, it doesn't even go on a poster well. The visual texts, which are more interesting within a documentary, can be difficult to interpret and may require expert knowledge to have them make sense. And those visual texts don't always exist, meaning that the interest of documentary makers may be skewed towards the spectacular rather than towards the significant. Beyond that, good historians aren't always good on camera. Again, in my experience of filming for JCU video material, being pithy and editable is a skill that has to be learnt. I hope I've kind of learnt it, and I've seen colleagues struggle with it as well, whereby giving a full, intelligent and scholarly answer, they're not going to be interesting to an audience watching a video, and they need to be carefully coached to give a pithy, short, editable answer instead. In addition, the need to find visual material can impose its own limitations on recorded history. Access to particular locations or to particular resources may carry implicit or explicit limitations on their use. People who give documentary makers access to locations or resources or to their expertise are trusting the documentary maker not to make them appear foolish, not to tell stories which may harm them, and to exercise justice in terms of not misrepresenting what they want to say by mis-editing them. Documentaries also in some ways cheat because of that requirement for visual communication or because of the ability that visual communication gives. Often there is implicit information in the background chosen when interviewing a documentary subject. Backgrounds can give interview subjects authority that they might not really possess. And certainly people who are wielding the camera are generally aware of the importance of a background that reinforces what their person is saying. You may notice in my face to camera sections at the start of my lectures that I stand in front of a bookshelf. That's a considered decision which I hope lends me some credibility. Similarly, insignificant footage can be made significant in the viewer's mind if it appears as wallpaper at a significant point, or if it happens to coincide with a particularly rousing part of the background music. Documentaries also cheat in the sequencing of their visual material. If you've ever watched a war documentary which seems to show the launch of some projectile through to a view of the explosion it causes, be aware that the launch, the thing in flight, and the thing exploding will almost certainly not be the same projectile. By running those images together, it appears that a full sequence for that particular object has been achieved, but it is very rarely the case. And film editing often involves a lot of shuffling of sequence. Again, we have to rely on the ethics of the person doing that shuffling to produce a sequence which is truthful. 
And that need for truth within documentary is something that we tend to rely on documentary makers to achieve and that we rely on their sense of ethics to enforce. Those strong historical examples where film has served as propaganda show that not all filmmakers have quite a strong enough sense of ethics. And that's where I'm pulling this to a close. I'm hoping that in tutorial this week, we'll have a good discussion about the way that documentary is used to represent the past and to communicate history. And that after this week, we'll all be a bit more critical of the documentaries that we watch. And potentially, you might be ready to use film yourself in order to convey history that you're interested in.